that jive and this is when like uh, you know BDP was blowing up I remember they had us interns sit in a room and pull out the demo tapes and all we did was erase them so they could do stuff with them so we just had a big magnetic eraser I hope I'm not spilling like jive RCA's beans but cassettes like you know people send in their best cassette like their best gold a TDK you know with the gold ribbon metal cause nice cassettes they cost like twenty dollars for the cassette I got this big Radio Shack erase and they would explain it to us like we can't listen to it because if one of our artists releases anything like it that person would say you stole it so it was almost like legally there was like we can't do anything with it like what wow. you know what I mean like so if you manage to put it in a guy's hand or be there while he listened to it that's one thing but just blindly sending your tape in it was in a box and me and another intern is female intern named Deborah I was even getting tapes for my own personal four tracks I was like, ooh, this is a nice tape. Put that in my bag. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and, you know, that was cassettes back in the day. It wasn't CDs in the world. So, I mean, I knew it was a sucker's game. I was like, guys, we can do our own. Look what Dr. Dre's doing. Look what NWA did. They just, sure they had dope money. We don't need dope money. You know what I mean? We can just, if we work together, we can take our limited resources and put that together and build something. So I proposed kind of this collective that later would be perfected by the Wu-Tangs of the world. And I always look at them as like, see, that was, they did what we were trying to do. That's exactly what we were trying to do. We can make our own video. We can make our own record. Sell it directly to the people. You know what I mean? So anyway, but we did manage to do the first batch. You know, we came back. We had like over 500 cassettes. Um, we split them, you know, and... You probably want me to go a little bit over how we recorded it. You know, I told you we did it in one month. It was September 1991. I said, we're going to take one month. Um, let's divvy it up. Everybody gets two songs. Every artist gets two songs. If you have a producer, that producer could come in and dump. He'd just come into my living room. We'll record it. I have, my studio was my living room. You know what I mean? I had the four track. I had my turntable set up. I had records. And I was like, he could bring his equipment in, drop his track on, and, and then, you know, you rap on it. So um, some of the guys had producers, you know, they were dealing with, and that's how, like, the Earthquake Brothers, you know, uh, Mathematics, um, Ola was working with AC, you know, but then everybody else um, didn't have production. Me and Matt became real good friends, you know, because he had some, his beats were, like, hot. I was just like, I like this dude. Like, this is a dude I want to be friends with. He has an ear. And so me and Matt just like hit it off like bosom buddies. I was just like, you know. So between me, B, uh, D, my partner, and Matt, we pretty much sewed up the majority of the production on that first To Whom We Make Concern record. Um, I had the brunt of it, me and D. And D, uh, D was always considered this like silent partner who never existed because you never saw him. Like, you know, he was working his job too, nine to five. And, um, but he and I would get together and make beats, you know what I mean? So I would have beats on deck that he co-produced with or did stuff on. So um, that's why he got production credit because he made beats even though he wouldn't be in the room when it was getting recorded. Um, but we, you know, we, we got together and, you know, sure enough, we, me and D had our two tracks, Sunshine Man, Legal Alien, and we had already been recorded that. So we were, we were kind of like shopping that almost like a demo. We were going around and we talked to managers and so forth. Um, so we were working that. We had our songs. Uh, I remember... Um, I used to have to go pick up Mike in peace. I had a car. They didn't have cars. Um, AC would sometimes get dropped off by his girlfriend. I, I, think he, I think he would borrow his girlfriend's car, but I would even pick him up. I mean, so my day consisted of going in, doing record marketing for eight hours, getting out of work, driving to in the L.A., mid-city, picking up all the guys, driving them to my house. We record and shoot the breeze and shoot the shit till like 1, 2 in the morning, take them back home, sometimes kick it at their house. Then come home, go to sleep for a couple hours, get up, go to work, do the whole thing again. That was my life for that whole month of September 1991. And, and you know, I was young. Sleep didn't really matter. We were having fun, making great music. It was, I was just loving it. I was like, we are making awesome tracks. Like, every track was blowing my mind, you know. And so we finished, and, 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 and then I went. And, um, 
And, you know, not to put everybody's business on the table, but everybody didn't come with their $120. You know, I said, you got one month to raise $120. $120 in one month. And, you know, maybe that's some arrogance in me. I had a job, so I had a check coming every two weeks. So $120 I already had in the bank. I was already good. But, you know what I mean? I was like, if you don't got it, borrow from your mom, your grandma, you know, sell whatever you need to sell. Talk to him to do bum money. It's one hundred twenty dollars. Like to me, one hundred twenty dollars. Like, dude, that's a pair of Air Jordans. Like, you could, you a grown man. You could get that together. You know what I mean? Like, so I kind of, I came at it maybe not necessarily in the kindest terms, but I, to me, one hundred twenty dollars was not a lot of money in nineteen, you know, ninety one. So. Um, you know, especially the way people flossed what they flossed and clothing and behavior and weed smoking and everything they did. I was like, you can cut back in some areas and get your hundred twenty dollars. You know, that was that was my mentality. And you know, the time came. We were like, let's do this record. Okay, guys, I'm ready to go to the pressing plant. I had already spent like, I think I, I, it was like five six hundred dollars to get it like sort of. I called it mastering, but basically he he just uh, put it up on a two track, EQ'd it, the whole thing, spliced it together. That was back in the time before computers, so he had to actually splice two inch tapes together and so forth. Um, he put it all together for us, made it a little warmer, and then gave us a master reel to take into Rainbow Records to press our cassettes. Um, so I had that. We we separated the sides, we sequenced it, the whole thing. So I covered all of that. Um, I show up for the guys in our next meeting, our little business meeting, and I'm like. Okay, everybody, I need that money because um, you know, I need to put that in the bank so I can write a check. You know, they don't need a deposit to get started. And you know, D had his, D had a job. AC had his, AC had a job. Some others, a piece had his, he had a connect who gave him some money, as, you know, and the others did not so much so. And it was like, all right. So I ended up paying for a couple other people's part, you know. Um, but because I was, I was steamrolling, like it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And they contributed tracks, so I was like, okay, you put the track in, the, the record sounds lovely, I, I love what this is going to be like, so I got you, man, don't worry, I got you. So we go, we press it, comes back like weeks later, it's completed, you know, we go through all the, the mastering pro and the process of, you know, um, listening to how good it sounds on cassettes. I happened to work at a print shop at the time, too. So I made the cover, like literally a buddy of mine shot the photo, gave me the negative, I took it to the print shop, I made a mock-up of a cover with the label, you know, it came out real dark, but we were like, oh, okay, whatever, man, we don't have time, we don't have time, we gotta get, you know, so we didn't be a perfection with it, it looked kind of like punk rocky, crappy, but it was like, we got it done, I had to get it out, you know what I mean? I was like, we are on a timeline. I, that was me, it was like, I'm trying to push the timeline. We gotta have this record, because we got our album release party at The Good Life. That's how we gonna do it. And so, into September, you know, October, like first week of October, first Thursday, we like, we gonna go into The Good Life, and we're going to all sign up. We're going to get extra early, and we're going to sign up for, the, for all the slots so that we're in order, like our record. It's going to be just us. So everybody's going to, you know, see song after song, like, what is all this new material? And it's going to be us. It's like our show. Like, you know what I mean? So because it was open mic and it was first come, first sign up, we lined it up. Like, and we tore the good life down. Like, we went in and we had a mission and we conquered. It was just like Operation Shock and Awe. And the good life was spellbound. They were just like, and we came out and we was like, cassettes for sale outside. Bam, we, you just saw the show. Do you want them tracks? Stand outside to the parking lot. I had a bag of tapes. Slang it, you know, and that was a bit of good life. You would like open my people were battle outside and stuff, but we did, that was our night. We killed the stage, went to the parking lot, killed the parking lot, sold cassettes, you know. And, um, yeah, I mean, I have to give a, a shout out to a uh, chilling villain empire because they used to make shirts, they were real organized, they were real. So I was like, I envied that. I was like, we need to hustle like that, guys. Like, see how they, you know, what I mean, like they got it together. You know, who they are, they all got the same shirt. That's the easy move right there. Like, so we, we were like, we need to, you know, amalgamate into something so we're a, a cohesive unit that people can understand, you know. Um, I have to give the shout out. I believe it was Mike who came up with the name Freestyle Fellowship. Um, and that was a brainstorm session in my living room. We would all sit there. I mean, we would record and then we would brainstorm. We would talk, we would record. We, all this is happening in my living room. We're just, you know, um, you know, the, um, we will not tolerate track. Um, I remember we were talking about making a, a song that we all performed on together. And um, 
Mike was like, okay, we, you know, Mike always would propose something left field. And he was like, can you make a beat that's like in like seven eighths, you know, not four four, which if you know music, like not common time, like which is most hip hop is in, you know, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. He's like, no, make it with like seven beats. Like seven beats per bar or whatever. And I was like, you know, we're not jazz musicians. Uh, you know, when the sampler, I don't know what you're looking for. You know, so he's like, but I want something just out the left field. Mike, you know, and I, that was Mike. So I, he went in my back bedroom. I had a one bedroom. He went in my back bedroom with all the MCs. I'm in the living room. And I put on, um, you know, the Run DMC record. You know, it's like that. And I just sampled seven beats you know it was like bun, dun, 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 bun, dun. i was just like you know i i just cut the beat off after the, the number of beats i mean if you listen to the sample of the track that's all it is it's i cut it off before it does a full two bar thing and then i looped it and it's kind of cool because that bun, the hit comes at odd times and so when they heard me in the living room doing that he comes out and they're like, we will not buy to tolerate beating, didn't buy to talk to me of black, buy to uh, do buy. Uh. He was like, wait a sec. Like, and it just, it just organically, it orga you know what I mean? That was one of those moments it was just like, what just happened, dude? We just, I was playing over here, you was playing over there. And you heard what I was doing in there and you was doing something in there and then it came together and it just, you know what I mean? That was one of the tracks we were just like, like by the time we finished recording it, I was like, wow, we made that work. Like, <laughs> that, that's, that's kind of tight. Like, what, you know what I mean? So we had several of those moments. I mean, like me and Mike used to have those moments all the time because Mike, I would have a beat and then Mike would come in and say, can you put this in there? Oh, Mike. You know what I mean? Like I was always like resistant, but he'd be like, he had a cassette that had like Miles Davis on it one time and it, um, it was Miles Davis explaining like some sort of uh, syncopation of music, and he was clapping, and he was like, um, "I need bop dit da bop 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 ba da, bat bat zi ba bop ba da." He was like, kind of just explaining it to the interviewer, and Mike had this on the tape, like this weird tape he comes in my house with, and he was like, "Dude, can you put like I want that in there?" And I was like, "What am I supposed to do with this, man?" I was like, "There's no beat. There's a dude talking, like clapping his hands and just kind of making some bebop sound or whatever," and he was like, "Just you know, put it in there, like you know." And this was Seven Seal. Like Seven Seal, Mike came with records, you know what I mean? Um, and he was like, I want to have this, and I want to have this. He was just like gumbo. He just brought everything he wanted to be in a track, but he had no concept of how to put it together. He just was like, I, want, I like the sounds of this. I like sounds on this. I like sounds on this. I like, and that's how he would. So Seven Seal, that's why if you look on the record, it says produced by me and Mike, because Mike came with records. He brought ideas that he wanted on the record, and then it was my job to put that in 4-4 and make it hip hop. Like I, I consider, cause I noticed everything Mike did without me, Mike had more influence in. Like Mike would go outside the norm and, and outside of you know convention. But I came up in convention, so I would always try to bend his ideas to convention. You know what I mean? So that's how Seven Seal got made. You know what I mean? Like he was like, oh, I want to fly away. And I was like, oh, well, I could backspin it and cut it coming back. Um, you know that bop, bop, bop. Bop, I found like a little snippet and it was like bop, cat, bop, 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 dim, bop, 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 you know, I just dropped it in on beat and it fit, you know, I, just enough that it didn't go off beat and, you know, and I would just, how's that sound? Okay, that's good. All right. Now that's it. Now he said, put this in. I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and that's, this is how me and Mike would work and, it, and, and every time, you know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I even think of, uh, um, what was that? Five o'clock follies. Five O'Clock Follies, same thing. He took an old beat that I had made for somebody else. Then it was that boom, da doom, doom, boom, to James, doom, da doom, doom, boom. And Mike was like, I like that, man, but something wrong. Something, you know, I, can you do something to that? So I just started the sample on a different downbeat. So it's boom, 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 boom. You know, it's like when you just choose a different starting point in the sample, it totally changes the whole concept of the sample. And so, you know, I have to say he opened my head up to that kind of thing because you forever be trying to satisfy as a producer, an MC who's going, I, I need something else. And you're like, 
Uh, you know, and I was studious, you know, I, me I remember uh, reading about Jimi Hendrix one time and they used to talk about, you know, him and his pedals for like distortion and stuff. And he would go to the engineer like, ah, I don't like this pedal, I need something else. And the engineer would just like shake it or reverse the polarity or something. <laughs> and then he'd be like, perfect, you know what I mean? Like, so I, I would be open to that kind of thing. Like, let me just do something to make it different and see what he says. And sure enough, he'd be like, oh, that's awesome. Like, it's, it's different, it's different. <laughs> right, it's different, that's awesome.